Hello and welcome. Um, we, in a moment we will get started. Um, Miriam, Guy and myself uh, with the conversation. So, uh, but, uh, but before we do, and uh, we're going to give everybody an opportunity to, uh, uh, to, uh, to join us. Perhaps they're um, jumping from, uh, from a previous meeting, so we don't want to jump the gun too, uh, too quickly. Um, some of you have found the, uh, the, the chat function already. If I could, uh, if I could just uh, uh, encourage you to, uh, uh, to let us know uh, where you're from, um, perhaps what time of day it is to, uh, to help us. We can, uh, we can adjust when, uh, uh, when answering your questions. There's going to be plenty of opportunity for you to, uh, to join us. Uh, if you're not familiar with, uh, with Livestorm, um, there's not too much to, uh, uh, that you need to, uh, to worry about. Uh, you've, uh, as you can see, you're, you're finding chat. There are no polls. Uh, but we will encourage you to uh, to find and use the uh, the emojis uh, as well. So uh, so just underneath the um, uh, the chat, you'll see that, uh, that there is a uh, button. And there we go. We've got some thumbs up already. Now that's a positive start. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so um, uh, as we go along, if you uh, you have any questions, then uh, then please feel free to uh, to pop them in. Uh, this is uh, the plan is to to make this interactive. Uh, oh hi, Timu. Uh, it's good to uh, good to see you. Um, uh, and thanks everybody for uh, for uh, for popping this in. Uh, uh, those in the chat, um, we will make sure that, uh, that that we can answer as many questions as we possibly can. The session will be recorded, um, and you'll get a copy of that recording um, uh, straight after the uh, the session is finished. Uh, and then you uh, may see that uh, that this pops up again on uh, on. Uh, YouTube on uh, a guy and I's channel. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I'll stop the waffling and we'll get into the session. Welcome to series two of LD's Pivots Performance and the first of five conversations. As with series one, Guy Wallace and myself, David James, will speak with esteemed guests about their own pivot from learning focused practice towards a performance orientation that more predictably and reliably, let alone efficiently and successfully achieves demonstrable results for both employees and organizations. For these five conversations, each two weeks apart, we've invited guests that have made the pivot themselves and have achieved real results from doing so. We'll invite our guests to share their stories, we'll question them on their approaches and encourage them to share relatable experiences to inspire you to either initiate or enhance your own pivot. And we'll also seek plenty of opportunities to get you involved too. But perhaps we should start by, with our own introductions, including our own pivot from a learning focus to performance focus. And Guy, would you like to kick us off? Thank you, David. Sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Guy Wallace. I've been in the performance-based training and development business, now known as learning and development, since 1979. When I first got out of college, I joined a training organization where I was immediately oriented to performance as the goal of learning. And I was in, encouraged to learn about the methodologies of the late Gary Rumler, Tom Gilbert, Joe Harless, and Bob Mager. Uh, they were very much alive back in those days, but uh, now they're no longer with us. I'm happy to partner again in this second year with David on this and have our guests share with us their pivot to performance. Uh, and uh, we hope that uh, you find it uh, uh, encouraging to you if you've not made that pivot yet, uh, because we would encourage you to make that pivot to a performance orientation in the learning and development that you produce for your firm. Thank you. Well, thanks, Guy. Um, and I'm David James. Um, I'm uh, nearly 25 years in learning and development, 15 of those uh, in organizations, uh, either part of L&D teams or or running local, say, UK learning and development teams and uh, and uh, Europe, Middle East and Africa as well. But I was later to enlightenment. Uh, I say that I uh, mine is a, a well-trodden path. I learned about training and development in the classroom, uh, and then I built up my skill set from there, uh, which I don't think is uh, is particularly uncommon. Uh, but it was in my role as uh, as director of learning talent and OD at Disney. Uh, that I really realized that uh, in order to do what I, I was then expected to do, then I needed to pivot from a learning mindset, which was much more around uh, encouraging people to engage in learning content and learning programs to one that was laser focused on helping people uh, to do uh, new jobs in new ways uh, or old jobs in new ways uh, to achieve different ends. 
Uh, and I think it takes a very different skill set. But first of all, I think it takes a different mindset uh, in order to get there. But I do think that, uh, that that many are along the journey, as was proved in Series 1, and I think we'll see in Series 2 as well. But that's enough about us. Let's welcome our first guest this year, the Head of Global Learning Design and Learning Sciences at Novartis, Miriam Neelan. Hello, Miriam. Hello, David. Hello, Guy. Hello, everyone. Happy to be here. Uh, well, Miriam, um, perhaps you could kick us off by giving us a short introduction to you and your background in LD, please. Yeah, so I've, I don't have that many years under my belt as Guy Wallace does, for sure. I think I was a toddler when he started uh, <laughs> in LD. I have about, I'm in, I've been in LD for about 15 years now. So before that, I was, I worked as a speech therapist. Um, I've always been interested in, how the brain processes things. I have a master's in psycholinguistics, which is more about how the brain processes language. So that's how I also ended up as a speech therapist because I wanted to work with people with neurological uh, disorders and help them to um, communicate um, effectively again. Um, one of the frustrations I had in that job is that uh, speech therapy was not very evidence-based. Uh, back in the days and so at some point I thought I want to kind of change careers because I don't think I can really build a career in a way that I uh, would like to so then I did a bit of research and ended up studying learning sciences again ending up in a field that is not very <laughs> evidence informed <laughs> but anyway um, I did my master's and uh, I then started the career as like more like an instructional designer. I did a lot of e-learning development. And then over time, I went to more strategic roles, more like leading projects and, you know, more responsible for the higher level design approaches. Uh, so not so much like actually developing uh, the content in any way. And in my current role, uh, my task is to build learning design capability across the organization so across uh, novartis uh, there's about 130,000 people i am in general of course they don't all do learning design um they do way <laughs> very important things i was going to say way more important things but um so there's about i think over a thousand learning people in novartis um it's quite challenging to know where they all sit. So the way I try to drive the change is that I engage with the business. So I pick with my team one or two projects each quarter so that we're actually solving real business problems. And then from that, we extract like things like case studies, but also frameworks, models, examples, um, whatever we can use to help others um, change their practice. And another pillar that I have is um, what I call the learning experience design community. So that is a sweep across the organization. So we, I, when I just started a job, I asked um, our learning committee to nominate people from across the organization, people who they think are strong in learning design. So I've been working with these people. So I started with a group of about 20 where we really started conversations around what learning design is and why we're here and my vision and to what extent they could buy into that vision and you know what evidence informed learning design means and all that good stuff and now we kind of like have changed that model a little bit in the sense that we now are working with more people so we have broader discussions around topics that they can bring up but i work really hard to keep these discussion structured so that we don't end up with just a bunch of opinions uh, flying around. We really try to create like clarity about what we mean with certain terms and, and whatever. And then we also do um, webinars and uh, what we call learning design jams. So these are more like peer to peer critique uh, sessions where people bring real projects and we uh, discuss how people can improve uh, their approach. That's well, it. In thanks, there's so much in there that uh, that we'd love to unpack, especially evidence informed uh, design. Uh, but before we do, uh, as Guy and I shared, you know, we we, we both uh, experienced a um, a personal pivot 
um, that, that's very different. And I wonder, wonder, did you have a, a personal pivot from one where you were learning oriented to one where you were much more performance focused? And if you did, what was normal for you before and what was your aha moment? So I didn't have like an aha moment as such, but so when I studied uh, learning sciences, I worked with the 4CID model. So this is described in the book, 10 Steps to Complex Learning. So what that does is it, it really helps you focus on tasks that people actually need to complete um, on the job. So that's my education. So I've always thought about learning uh, that way. Um, and then when I started working in actual organizations, I just realized that usually that's not, you know, what we design for. Um, we don't necessarily, at least from what I've seen in the organizations I work in, and especially at the beginning of my career where I was more, you know, junior and more like doing e-learning development, it was very hard for me to see how this specific e-learning that I was developing was actually helping people to do something different on the job so i've always seen that disconnect um although sometimes of course when you work on a specific piece of e-learning you might not be aware of all the other elements that are also designed so you might not always be able to see the bigger picture but it might still be there but anyway it always has frustrated me that i wasn't able to see that bigger picture so that i couldn't really understand like am i actually adding value here or or not so um, then, so so that that focus on work I've always had from the very beginning, just because of the way my master's uh, was designed. So later, when I started working for um, what, it was an applied research center, Learnovate, and also Accenture later on, that's when I really started to understand more about the business and uh, how they think about business problems. So that's when I started to think a bit more holistically in the sense that, um, for example, I remember when I worked uh, with Accenture, I was working with a team um, that were that they were about like how we could help clients um, to move towards blockchain solutions. So so I mean, I'm I'm using the wrong wording here, but it was basically about how how we could sell blockchain um, to our clients. And that required a whole different way of working and thinking about selling because it was no longer about selling to one client, but it was about like a partnership between various uh, parties. So anyway, when I started to do more analysis and talking to people in that space, I think that's when I really started to see that training or learning alone would not necessarily help them get there because there were all kinds of other things um, that needed to be fixed. As an example, I remember at some point I was doing some user research and it was about collaboration. And I had been told by my stakeholders that we needed to in include like collaboration in the training that we were designing. And I thought, hmm, what does that even mean? You know, like how, yeah, so I was a bit skeptical. So I started talking to people like on the audience and so I said, so tell me about how you work with other, like, you know, breaking silos and all that good stuff. And they said, yeah, it all sounds, sounds nice in theory. But in the end, when I partner with another uh, department, I basically need to share my revenue with them. So I'm not, you know, and I thought, OK, yeah, now we can we can train people to collaborate better. But I don't think that's the issue. You know, it's in the it's in the model, in the, in the incentivize, uh, how do you say that, reward, no, not reward incentivization what's the incentives i don't know what the word no, is. that's right that is right yeah anyway yeah so that's when i started to see um yeah more like the business models and i also started reading more about organizational learning which then you know it just kind of opens up your mind a little bit i think and your eyes when you look around and think eh, yeah this whole learning thing is not going to do the trick in and all like by itself mm. It's wonderful that you, you, you talked about uh, analysis and I wonder whether you have a structured approach or uh, or whether it could be cookie cutter um, in, uh, in, the, in the context uh, in which you, you discuss there. I know that, that from my own perspective, 
uh, you know, guy and a guy and I've talked about this before. I, I call it discovery because uh, because I find stakeholder groups averse to the word analysis in case it means there's going to be a delay to this thing that's about to be delivered uh, that they've asked for. Uh, so the softer approach and and something a bit more guerrilla style uh, to unpack what it what it is that they're that they're trying to achieve. But do you have a systematized um, approach to analysis or, um, or or something that you that that you've refined that works for you now? Um, I have systematized approaches in my head. Yes, however, <laughs> in reality, I don't necessarily follow them. I try. I try to be systematic uh, in the sense that I try to see like all the steps that I ideally should take. But in reality, it's usually quite messy in the sense that, and I actually learned this from Guy, like in the past, I had a tendency when a client would come to me with a request and, you know, they would send a bunch of content, for example, I would kind of immediately start to challenge them and say, well, how do you know this is a problem? And da, 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 da. so, uh, <laughs> I no longer do that. Um, I really, I, what I usually do and what I think works quite well is I bring the stakeholders together in a, in a usually a virtual whiteboard because I, I work with global teams. So I, I never really have a chance to really work with people face to face, but I bring them together. So for example, in a Miro board and we talk about, you know, what they're trying to solve. So kind of like a map it type exercise for like Kathy Moore has. And then what that does usually is that they start to see that they actually disagree a lot on what they actually are trying to achieve. So I think that's already helpful because they all come in with this, you know, this is what why we're here. This is the solution. And then if they start to realize that they don't even agree together, well, then that's for them to solve. Right. So that I don't have to challenge that anymore because they start challenging each other. Um, so I think that is helpful. And then when we get to a point where we agree that this is what the problem is, ideally, of course, I get some objective data to, to back that up and not just people saying uh, all kinds of things. Um, and again, I, I am aware of systematic approaches on how to do this. I don't always do it that systematically. It really depends on, on the time and the, the amount of stakeholders and the type of stakeholders that I'm dealing with. But then I usually find one or two subject matter experts who are willing to sit down with me and talk a bit more about the work. So that's when I do more like a task analysis type of thing. And um, sometimes there's a step before that. So if they send me a lot of content, I try to make sense out of that content and kind of already map it out in some kind of flow that I think and then I make comments like, is this to understand the concept of blah or so I try, you know, to show I'm really trying to understand what you're trying to achieve with this. And then um, when they start talking about the work, then we can then later map their content to what the actual work looks like. And what that does is that they start to realize that their content is not going to get them where they want to be. And sometimes that's fine and they'll say, OK, well, we don't have more budget, so we are still going to go with just this content. But then at least they realize at that point, well, that's not going to move the needle as much as we hoped um, it would. So to me, like the visualizing of that, this is what the works look like. This is what it takes. Right. So so I would talk about first at a higher level. What are the steps? Well, first you do this, then you do this, then you do that. And before that, I would have asked, and this is Guy's uh, work again, uh, what does the, what's the deliverable? Because that helps just people to kind of like be, become more concrete. The steps, so the sequence, and then for each step, I ask them, okay, what do you need to be able to do this? What do you need to be able to do? What do you, be, you need to be able to know? They're usually not well able to articulate them because they're master performers usually, right? Or subject matter experts. Um, so I usually just say things like, OK, it sounds to me that in order to be able to do this, you need to understand a hell of a lot about X. And then it's, oh, yeah, yeah, you need to do it. So uh, that's how they start to see. I, I ask about the tools that they use. Do they use certain templates? So that's do they collaborate with others along the way? So it just 
helps them to get insight, more insight into their own practice, which I can see people usually quite enjoy because it gives them a sense of like, oh, I'm doing all these things and I know all these. <laughs> so, um, so that's the step then. And then ideally, I'm trying to think, it kind of depends. Sometimes I then move towards creating an, a worked example with them. So that when I say worked example, what that means is um, now let's think about a really concrete scenario that you were, or project that you worked on recently in the context of this work. Let's think about really what it took, um, what, what you need to do, how you need to do it and why you need to do it that way. So it just goes like one level deeper. I also then probably ask more questions around, okay, so what usually goes wrong? Like what are the mistakes that can happen? And all that, so to just that one level deeper, which is then really to understand what it will take to learn the work. Wonderful. There's so there's so much great stuff within there, Miriam. Uh, that 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 I'd love to to just check my understanding, but also to to um, uh, to to um, uh, help to summarise for for the attendees. If if anybody uh, who's listening has got any questions, then then please do uh, ask. I'm gonna I'm just gonna explore this uh, a little bit more with uh, with Miriam. But but first of all, a comment, Miriam. What I love about that is that you you clearly you're educated in uh, uh in in this area so you have the you have the the uh the education plus uh you have uh which i don't think could be understated the diplomacy uh because you know guy, guy you know that i've seen posts that, that you write before uh, don't say no to a training request <laughs> it's absolutely critical so many people fall down at the point where they don't wish to take the training request on this on the step on uh, i don't know whether it's principle or whether there is the, this is the point in which they'd like to educate their stakeholder that training isn't going to work but what i also love about it as well is in understanding what to work on in the first place you get in a load of stakeholders it's kind of you know it, it reminds me um of uh, a little bit of, of um, cognitive task analysis. Like when you get into the task, if master performers don't know 70% of, of up to 70% of, of what they do in order to complete the task, it's, what I love about the approach to the analysis is, does your stakeholder fully understand the problem that they're seeking to solve? And with more people there, are you gonna get a grander understanding of all of the implications rather than the one part that it's been uh, perceived uh, is the uh, is the issue again. As as I said, like you've got all, all of these areas, but that, that you're combining to bring stakeholders on a journey and make sure that you're not wasting their time or the organisation's uh, precious resources on doing something that isn't going to move the needle. Yeah, I think that is a really good point. So so what that that whole even that whole task analysis thing, like when you then present that back to stakeholders, that's when they start to realize this, you know, what it really takes to do this mm. work, because they talk, especially now with all the skills hype and stuff, people talk about skills a lot, but they don't realize that usually, especially in, in knowledge worker type context, that usually when we say skills, we're actually talking about complex skills. And what that means is, and I, I won't give like a whole lecture on complex skills here, but that we're, it's not one skill. It's not like, oh, first you do this and then you do that and you do that. It's usually when we say data analysis, for example, well, that's actually a suite of constituent skills that are either temporal or vertical, you know, one and like, for example, um, analytical skills, they would enable certain, so that's, that's an enabling skill. So, I mean, it's really complicated, right? So I think a task analysis really helps people to realize I just want to make one comment. You kind of make me uh, laugh when you say uh, di diplomacy, because <laughs> because if my colleagues would listen to this, not my not my business colleagues, not my business, not the people in the business, because with them, yes. But when I work with my <laughs> my own team, I, I would I would be way stronger in my language and call things <laughs> out as BS and nonsense. And so yes, but I can do it, guys. I really can. 
<laughs> Brilliant. Well, we're getting we're getting questions in, but I've got one more question to ask you, Miriam, before we we go uh, to those. Um, to what extent do you um, seek data at this point? I mean, you've you've talked that from from what you've described. There's anic data from the stakeholders, but to what extent do you pursue data with them to validate um, um, issues and to understand it more? Um, or again, is, are you diplomatic in that approach, depending on, on what it is? I must admit that so far, I have found it really challenging to get objective data from stakeholders. Like I, I've, I've recently worked with, uh, I'm trying to think how I can share this without going into too much detail, but with a project that actually did like market research and, and really had evidence that their sales numbers were decreasing because of X, Y, Z. So, but that was actually, one of the first times that I have really seen people coming with more objective evidence to show me that this was actually a problem. I've seen uh, the majority of products I've worked on was mostly stakeholders saying that, you know, that, that they had data, but they didn't really think they had to show it to me because I was just a learning person. <laughs> interesting yeah i'm sure we've, we've all been there so i would uh, pursue God. it i would ask mm. uh but but yeah i haven't had um which i think is actually terrible but i think you should definitely try to to get it yeah yeah of course because then you know that that that's the way that we get past the uh not just did we make an impact but did we desire uh, did we make the desired impacts and of course it goes some way to addressing uh the, the the boogeyman for energy yeah so I, okay. can i can i say something about that because i think yes that's the ideal to me yeah. the way i try to move the needle at the moment is i i, I don't even focus on that at the mm. moment what i focus on is and i'm not saying you shouldn't ideally you should but i think if we're first able to really focus on the work and what people actually need to do on the job if we if we focus there, I am already quite happy. So um, I am not even ROI and I, I mean yes, I just yeah. I, there's so many variables and so little data in my yeah. experience. So yeah, that's why I focus on the on the work and the context at the moment. Yeah. So so trusting that if people are doing enough of the right stuff and that and and that's determined by your key stakeholders, then that's going to be able to deliver the results. Yeah, that's yeah. that's then my assumption. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd like to invite Guy in. Uh, I don't know if you have any uh, uh, questions or comments, Guy, or, or anything's come in from uh, on the on the chat so far. Yeah, there's a couple of things here. The first one, I think, is a, a quick answer. Do you think that getting a master's degree in learning sciences or some equivalent field is is worth it? Well, to me, it's definitely worth it. Uh, the reason is that um, I think it makes it easier to distinguish between fads and uh, more objective, like real information. Um, just because you have a more foundational knowledge level, you know the research that's out there, you know what it what has what is more like high quality evidence than something else. So I think it just makes it easier. And I think it also, in my uh, experience, for me, it has made it easier to have conversations with my stakeholders because I am usually able to explain why we need to take a certain approach. So I give you one example. I did an assessment recently of an existing learning program and it's a very, uh, it's a detailed example, but they had very training focused language in the, in the sense that, oh, complete this video, watch this video first before you move on to the next thing. So I gave them a lot of recommendations around how to change their language to be more informal and uh, focused, you know, orienting people on where they are in the journey. And one of the feedback pieces I got was, well, how do you know this? Like, did the users complain or whatever? And I was like, no, they didn't. I know this because I know Myers multimedia principles and I know all the things about, you know, what makes learning more effective for people. So that's what I base my recommendations on, not because the learner says I don't like this. So I think this type of 
it's it's just you can make rec recommendations based kind of like on your knowledge and not on what people say hey Gaius disappeared I don't know why that's happened here I didn't uh, click on anything but uh, so the the uh, there's a comment here that they uh, the uh, Clement liked this step around seeking disagreement and I really thought I had made notes uh, as you were talking about that that um, I think it's important to get your stakeholders aligned. And one of the things, as you said, is that when you start talking with them, and it's great when they're all together doing this, because if you're talking to them one-on-one, -on -one, they don't quite see it, but they don't agree. And getting them aligned to what is it that we're trying to do and affect, I think is a really critical step. So, you know, that's something that may not be covered in a typical ISD, LXD kind of a program, but I think that, that you're always dealing with stakeholders and they're going to come out of the woodwork at some point during your project or when it's all done. And it would have been so much better to get them involved back on day one. For sure. And 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 just for the person who asked about the, the value of the, the masters. So I stick to my answer. I also want to add, you don't learn anything about dealing with challenging stakeholders in a master's, you know, learning, you know, about the learning sciences. So you would still have to learn a lot when you, when you actually start working. Well, I do have a question on that, Miriam, because I wonder if, uh, did you have steps towards that? Because I know that, that, that um, there would have been stages in my career um, don't you know what? I, even even when I, when I was uh, director at uh, Disney, there would have been certain stakeholders where I just thought, but you know what? Let's just bring everybody in a room. I didn't ask, uh, ask that because you know I, I learned from you know, from you in this conversation uh, about that approach. I'd love to have, but I can see how it would have benefited me. And there would have been some where I would have thought, Do you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna take what you're saying as read because this is this is going to distract us from doing anything. Uh, and probably harm my career uh, if I suggest that we bring other people in. Were, were, were there steps towards this approach, Miriam, that, that you would have taken? Because there are going to be plenty of people uh, listening to this uh, who think, well, I don't have the currency in my organisation to, to be able to do that. Yeah, so definitely. So um, usually earlier in my career, I usually got like an appointed subject matter expert, right? So that's when I was still more like designing actual um, interventions myself, like the details of it. Uh, so then I, I really had or had to, I didn't challenge them really. I could just try to partner with them as best as I could. Um, but then when I worked with Accenture, I was lucky enough that I was, so I was in an internal, um, consultancy team so i wasn't working with external clients with internal clients but i was like working with the business like a hundred percent i was like aligned with a certain team so what that means is that you get an opportunity to build relationships uh with people over time so you might start you know with one subject matter expert and then you know when you do uh a good job then you know they they let you engage with like a more senior person you know so uh, it kind of like build over time and I never really realized that that's what I needed to do until I did it. It was just so eye opening. Like I was like, Oh, <laughs> I think I should do this more often. Um, so it kind of happens or organically, uh, I would say. And so therefore I would now encourage people to ask for a group, uh, and not just, not when you, when you, when you just, I don't mean it's in a, I was going to say just do content development. I'm just saying that you probably don't have an opportunity then because I don't think they will allow you to work with a group of stakeholders. When you work on a more strategic or higher level design uh, level, then yeah, just ask, okay, who else, who else can we ask? Who else needs to be involved? I think it's always worth trying. Yeah, no, I agree. We um, have uh, one last question here about uh, what's your experience in, in changing the mindset that you are just the training person and not working on performance to performance improvement? I do, <laughs> I do remember one situation where where a stakeholder said, um, you know, I was kind of trying to sell space learning over time and I explained that people remember better and da 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 da. 
and then and then this person said oh that's not true miriam because when i watch netflix and when i binge watch i remember way better than than when i watch like one episode you know every week or every and i just was quiet for a couple of well i didn't know how to respond and then i just said well i don't know that much about the science of netflix but i do know a little bit about the science of netflix. <laughs> <laughs> okay but so um the way i responded to you know the way i try to change that is to really try to understand what they're trying to achieve so all i'm doing is asking them questions about okay so why what's the problem what do people need the why do people what do people need to achieve um so i really try to focus on what they are trying to achieve and keep that front and center at all times and then you know even they would not take me seriously right talking about learning objectives i would say things like okay sorry but when i look at these learning objectives last time i heard you say this this and this is important I really I don't really understand how these objectives will help us achieve this. So what's your thinking? Da, 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 da. And at some point they they just realized that I was trying to help them achieve what they needed to achieve. And I think that's all you need to focus on, to be honest. I think it's quite simple. It will take a while before and it requires a lot of effort. As in you need to listen and you need to go through all kinds of you know, stuff that they send you and really try to understand what it means. Mm. Yeah, so you can't it, be lazy. Is it fair to say as well, Miriam, that you that, that job is never completed? There's not one point in which everyone in your organization says, mindset changed. Like the 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 very next comment when you've got it, think you've got it nailed, you've convinced a really tricky stakeholder, you've done some great work. The next thing that's likely to come around your door is someone asking just for oh, it will be a new person yeah so you need to start yeah. all over again yeah 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 it, yeah precisely that that job is never done but i think that that you uh, end up building a reputation that's largely um developed around helping the organization to achieve desired outcomes and not necessarily just delivering stuff um and then wondering whether it works but but again yeah, the the, the work's never done um, yeah, and again, it's a bit more we, tricky when you constantly work with different clients, right? Because yeah, mm. yeah, it's it's just more difficult. Yeah, yeah, completely agree. Um, look, uh, we'll get on to uh, to the next uh, plan question here, uh, but I would uh, encourage if anybody's got any questions, we will be stopping again uh, shortly. To, so so take this opportunity to uh, uh, to prepare uh, questions in the chat. But uh, but uh, Miriam, I wonder whether we've we've spoken here about um, uh, about your your approach, and I wonder if we can ground this in some practical reality. And I know that you stopped short earlier of a of a of a practical example, but without divulging IP. Um, is, is there a real life example that you can give to us of how a, a problem was presented to you or a request for training came to you, uh, the analysis you did, perhaps the stakeholders you involved um, and what you did uh, in order to uh, to affect performance? Yeah, so I'll go with a bit of a recent example, um, which was where there was already an existing program and initially the request was more around we need to move our stuff over to the learn new learning experience uh, platform and we've done our best uh, but can you just assess it and give us some um, ideas on how we can make it better so i had some initial conversations with uh, the training person so th this person was actually a subject matter expert in a training role so knew a lot about the business uh, and less about training, uh, which actually was better for me <laughs> in this case. So I, he was able to show me data that they had a problem that the sales numbers went down um, because of um, you know less opportunities. It's a lot lot to do with COVID, uh, less face to face um, meetings with uh, with customers. So sales uh, figures decreased. And um, so this uh, program was focused on uh, helping people to build more online um, presence and, and, and engaging with customers. So I assessed the learning uh, program and I 
thought to myself, okay, there is a lot of content here, and there's a lot of good content here. Uh, I don't really understand why it's sequenced the way it's sequenced. I don't really see any like real life examples for people to really understand. I thought it was all a bit abstract. Um, and as I said earlier, like the language was quite like focused on you're here to complete the training kind of uh, language. And so I suggested to do a task analysis to, to, to say, to just to take a look at, you know, to what extent is your current program actually mirroring the, the, the actual work? Um, so my, my client was open to that, so we did that. And um, so that way I was able to go back and say, okay, now that I know what the work, act, what it actually takes for people to do these things, I could make better recommendations around why the sequence had to change and why the flow had to change and what it would take for people to get there. And also what it did was my client, because of the task analysis, was way better able to see like, oh, we have this now as part of our training, but in order for people to actually change their behavior and build new habits and understand, you know, what's allowed and what's not allowed, like we need to provide way more support and guidance like over time so um it's in in the end it just really helped to move from what i call a training focus to a capability building focus so it just really helped them and another thing that they realized is that they were making quite a lot of assumptions around how this training was going to actually impact more um engagements with clients and then is that then going to lead to more sales right like it, it, it that so it just kind of helped them to think about okay what are we actually expecting to happen and and really thinking about okay how can we set some good hypotheses and then how can we then design to test if that's actually going to happen so yeah it was quite interesting I'd imagine incredibly satisfying as well, because I know that, that from my experience, when, when we talk about this stuff, um, the resistance that we get a lot of the time is that my stakeholders won't be open to this. But it sounds like from that conversation, how can a stakeholder not be welcome to becoming more enlightened about the problem that you're seeking to solve? And also uh, a, a, a friendly, um, encouraging challenge to what you're thinking might might help like is likely not i mean i mean how satisfying is it and what kind of reactions do you you get in the room to this stuff are you asking me yes miriam <laughs> am i the guest of honor <laughs> um i think well one i think i was lucky with this customer in the sense that they were very open to feedback and they really wanted to help their people improve you know this 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 behavior so that's one thing um the other so what i've noticed is that that training people people are owning programs they are often incentivized to deliver the program and that's it. So the more users, completions, you know, that's what people get, like, they, that's what makes them visible. So there is a challenge there. And I remember, like, with, this, with, with one of this type of people, like, they kept saying to me, um, yeah, but I need to show that my problems, uh, my program is successful, right? That's what I need to show. And I said, can I, can I just give you something? Can I plant a seed in your head here? Like, I don't think it's your job to show how successful your program is. I think it's your job to be crystal clear with your leadership, what you're trying to achieve. And it's your job to tell them, if you think that this is not going to get them there, that's what you're owning. You're owning the capability you're not owning, don't worry about your program. You can change your program. Your job is to make sure that people are able to do this stuff so that they can support this business goal. That's what, why you're here. So if you, if you don't trust, if you think that your program is not adding a lot of value, you need to go back to your leadership and say, 
I don't think this is doing the trick. We need to change because X, Y, Z. Mm. And it was really, he just looked at me and goes, oh, I've never thought about it that way. <laughs> but I think that's their responsibility as, as, as trading leads or whatever leads they are owning these programs. They need to also get that business mindset and not the performance mindset and not the, the training program mindset. Mm. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, Miriam. Um, we, I'll, I'll put one more shout out for, uh, for questions because I've got one more question before, uh, before uh, we'll invite more uh, uh, invite guy back to uh, to to share yours, but um, but one one thing I've I've noticed from what what you've said here, Miriam, is that um, that many people want a job like yours. Uh, what I mean by that is one where uh, a conversation about the work is welcome, and that they can and that they can then do meaningful work in learning and development. But what I'm hearing from you is that you've not waited for this to happen and that that you're initiating these conversations that might be more difficult. Well, I'd say that they are more difficult than than uh, what training would you like? What would you like in it? And when would you like it delivered? Um, you know, the, the, this is the I mean, you've got me fired up. <laughs> I thought it was my job, but you got me fired up to uh, um, uh, that, that this is really what we're what we're all about. And so so. My last question to you is um, you're going to have inspired plenty, plenty more people who are here today or, or listening back on the podcast or uh, uh, or the recording. So what what advice would you give to them if they are thinking of adopting a similar approach so that they are moving conversations more towards um, uh, the work to be done, the tasks and uh, and. Uh, and and outputs uh, or they're thinking of adapting uh, approach because because they're a little further down the line of uh, of uh, performance orientation what what advice would you give yeah i i i would suggest to really try to start with something like a task analysis because and and the way you could frame it i think is let's make sure that the people who we're trying to serve here that they actually get what they need so that they can support what you're trying to achieve. So let's spend a little bit of time. It doesn't have to be, it's like one to two hours. If uh, that's about one, one piece of work, right? It's not, if you have a full blown program, it doesn't matter. Start with something small that you can do in one or two hours with, with a stakeholder. And so that you can start to demonstrate to them why a program needs to change and what it takes for people to to do that piece of work so to me and and if you're even before that so if the program is quite abstract you know with sometimes can, programs can be a bit fluffy with a lot of self self-directed stuff and then self-reflection or whatever you can use to say okay let's try to really understand what we expect people to do with this so then you can also uh, ask for like a task analysis or another option could be ask a stakeholder or SME to create an example for you. So, I mean, you have to partner with them and you need to give them some kind of template to say, okay, can you help me understand so that we can help the learners understand what, what a real life scenario could look like for this. And then, and then you can use that almost as I mean, I call it a worked example. That's that's quite a lot of work. But if you can even start with a scenario or real life example, then you can kind of use that to move the conversation um, on to make things more concrete and contextualized. Brilliant. And uh, and in terms of uh, uh, task analysis, uh, is there is is this something that you've developed, or is this something that you that you lean on that's been developed before, Miriam? I have developed like my own templates, but I mean, I know because guys books are, are great. I can imagine that they can be a bit overwhelming if you haven't done this before. Mm. Um, but mine is really simple. Like what are this, what is the output? So the, what is the skill they talk about? So say uh, leadership, that's the skill. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> let's break that out a bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, feedback delivery okay let's start with that feedback delivery what does that look like well we have different situations so yeah try to just find something to make it more concrete and then what are the enablers for this thing 
what do you need to do? What do you need to know? What are the tools people are using? It all sounds very simple. It's not necessarily, but it's fun. Yeah. It's one of the things that I enjoy the most doing with clients. And, 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 and I mean, I, I, I imagine that your, your advice would be just do it, wouldn't it? I mean, just don't, you know, don't think about it. Have, have a conversation with the, with the stakeholder where it really matters that they get an outcome rather than just, just want something delivered and have that conversation about those outcomes, you know, would, would, I mean, because you'll gain confidence from doing it, won't you? Yes, you do. And you learn a lot as well. I mean, really go in with just trying to understand the work. Like, what, mm. what do people actually need to do? I don't understand. Help me understand. And mm. use that as your... <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so uh, so um, I see that, uh, that we've got... Uh, we've, we've, uh, we've got one more question, which is uh, which is around uh, around the recording, but uh, but we don't have any um, uh, uh, any others on here. Uh, and to uh, to answer that uh, that question, um, uh, we we will be sharing the recording uh, from the wonders of LiveStorm. Uh, for anybody who's not used this before, um, this will be uh, you'll receive an email almost immediately uh, with the, with the recording uh, wrapped up uh, on here. Uh, but before we do um, wrap up, uh, Guy, do you have any uh, closing questions or, uh, or or comments? Well, I, I think uh, I'm sorry I disappeared there for a while. I'm not sure what happened, but uh, I was able to get back in. But I think that Miriam's point about uh, and, and talking with her uh, a course owner that, uh, you know, there's too often a focus on learning activities as our measure rather than the business results. And I think getting uh, ISD, LXD people to focus on the business results and not be so focused on, you know, learning activities and measuring, you know, completions and things like that. That's, that's a difficult journey for some because their leadership reinforces that look and doesn't reinforce the look like your clients might want on actual results in their business operations. So uh, thank you for sharing that, Miriam. Wonderful, thanks, Guy. Um, look, Miriam, this has been this has been hugely insightful. I think that, uh, that the reason that, uh, that the last question on here was will the recording be shared is that you've 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 dropped so much gold here uh, that I, for one, will be listening back uh, and I'll be um, certainly sharing this uh, on the podcast and as we said on uh, on on YouTube as well. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody who's uh, who's joined us today and uh, uh, and uh, and also contributed with uh, with their comments. Uh, we do have uh, another session in two weeks time. Uh, Guy, would you like to tease us with the, uh, with the guest uh, in two weeks? Uh, gee, I'm not really prepared for that. Who is it? <laughs> Lost track of the sequence of our guests, but uh, yeah, who is it? I think it's Carl, Carl Binder. Oh, Carl Binder, one of my heroes. Yes. Yeah, so he's a, he was the, one of the last graduate students of BF Skinner at Harvard. Um, he's been involved in this for 40 some years. Uh, I've known him almost that long. Um, and uh, he brings uh, uh, the late Tom Gilbert's uh, behavior engineering model. He's done a refresh of that, put it in the more common language. And he, he will bring and he will share with us his experiences uh, in helping his clients, you know, focus on performance, what, what he would call accomplishments, what I would call outputs, pretty much the same thing. But uh, I think this will be another good session. Wonderful. Thanks, Guy. Uh, so, so that wraps up for today. Um, Miriam's all left for me to say thank you so much for uh, for joining us, and thank you so much for sharing uh, so much uh, of your insight. We really appreciate yeah, thank it. You thank you very you. much for having me. I, I really enjoyed it. I am gonna find the link so that I can attend the other ones because I think there's a lot to learn in this space. So, thanks and thanks everyone for being here and your questions. Wonderful. Thank you.